In 2013, over 1.5 million people in the UK started an undergraduate degree, and I was one of them. From the first moment I visited the music department at Sheffield University, I knew it was the place for me. The course seemed perfect. The city was beautiful. And I left the open day with that excited gut feeling you get when you just know that something or somewhere is right for you. Ten months later, I'd got the grades I needed and I packed my life into my parents' car and travelled 100 miles from my seaside hometown over the Pennines and into Yorkshire. I moved in with nine other people and lots of them had moved to Sheffield with friends or partners from their hometowns. Lots of them had people they trusted by their side or had grown up close by, which was lovely to see, but quite daunting when all my loved ones were a long way away and the only thing I had by my side was a brand new set of pans. <laughs> the first few weeks were very busy and quite overwhelming. The course was harder than I'd expected and away from familiar surroundings, I was less confident than I'd realised. People travelled home at the weekends and everyone else seemed to have things to do with other people, except me. After weeks of feeling alone, I became very anxious and down. Tears would come at times I least wanted them. And it was incredibly tough to get up every day and live a life that was so different to the one I'd expected. It was exhausting. I never explicitly said to my parents, I'm painfully lonely, I can't stop crying, and I don't know if I'll get my deposit back because I've melted a pan lid on the kitchen hob. <laughs> but they knew I was struggling. My mum sent amazing letters and parcels through the post, and Dad texts me every morning with a positive thought for the day and a dad joke to make me smile. Even though they couldn't physically be there for me, knowing they were thinking of me and rooting for me to do well made the difference. I wasn't going to give up on university life, but for a long time, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to feel at home in Sheffield to have friends, to have people there who loved me. But things did improve. Moving into a house in my second year made a big difference. Unlike first year, I had roots to return to. I recognised people and I had memories across the city. It was the start of feeling like I belonged in Sheffield. Fast forward 12 months and I was in my final year and Sheffield felt more like home than I'd ever imagined it could. During the first week of my final year, I walked out of the music department one afternoon and found a young student at the bottom of the stairs, alone, crying. My heart sank. I knew that feeling. I went straight over and put my arm around her. She told me that she was feeling overwhelmed and that had led to a bad experience during her flute audition for the university's ensembles. She thought, that she would never be part of an ensemble at university. I don't know about you, but I definitely believe that there are moments in life that happen for a reason. I just started conducting a non-audition flute ensemble. <laughs> we rehearse on Wednesdays, I told her, and we'd love it if you joined us. And she did. Over the next year, we had some great times together in weekly rehearsals and performances. And then all of a sudden, it was time for me to approach graduate life and leave the ensemble in the hands of a new group of people. Amongst the applications I read for the role of inclusions officer was a story. A story about a young woman who had been seen crying during her first week in Sheffield. And who had been invited into a group that had helped her settle into university life. I want to give people the same sense of belonging that flute choir has given me wrote Hattie. Lots of you will remember the late Joe Cox, who was tragically murdered in 2016. Before her death, Joe was a passionate member of parliament and she was campaigning to end loneliness and isolation across the country. She worked to promote a world that embraces the fact that we have more in common than that which divides us, if we choose to see it and act on it. 
Despite our country's rich history of community spirit and neighbourliness, the UK has recently been described as the loneliness capital of Europe. And the Office for National Statistics has found that loneliness is linked to a 26% increase in mortality risk. It can lead to anxiety and it can lead to depression. It can even lead to suicide. Suicide is currently the biggest killer of men aged 45 and under. I have a 28 year old brother and I have some male friends and it worries me that the biggest threat to their lives could stem from being lonely. Not sharing connections isn't just sad or a sign of the times. Loneliness is killing us. Because of this, and thanks to Joe's legacy, we're the first country in the world to have a Minister for Loneliness in government. <coughs> Joe famously said that loneliness doesn't discriminate, and she was right. There are a countless number of circumstances that can lead to people feeling lonely. The first responder, going from one emergency to another, alone. The quiet colleague in the office you pass every day. The junior doctor who's moved to a new city for a job they couldn't turn down. The shift worker, on duty all through the night and sleeping during the day. The patient in the hospital bed who doesn't get any visitors. It might even be you, right now. I could go on, and it's hard not to feel helpless and powerless when we think about all those that are lonely. But I regularly remind myself that even though I can't fix all of those things on my own, I can do something. Every one of us can do something. Today is all about shaping our legacy. And the reason I'm standing on this stage is because I believe in our combined power to make a difference to people's lives. We're all just a smile a conversation, an act of kindness away from making a difference. And even though that might not completely solve the complexities that lead to loneliness, it is a start. Earlier this year, I boarded a train at Sheffield Station, where I still live and now absolutely love. I was traveling to my grandma's for a family funeral, so I was in a fairly somber mood. Thankfully, the train wasn't too busy, so I chose the nearest table seat available, which happened to be opposite an older man. As I settled into my seat, we were joined by another gentleman, and as the train pulled away from the platform, the two men got chatting. By this point, I'd realised that my breakfast yoghurt had leaked in my bag and completely covered the dress I was supposed to be changing into for the funeral, so I'd accepted that this probably wasn't going to be the best day I'd ever had. I was all set to put my headphones in and block out the rest of the world for the remainder of the journey. But there was something infectiously captivating about the two men, and so I listened to them instead. Questions flew back and forth between them as they asked about their lives, their families, their hobbies. They talked about walking football, all about life in the army, and about Liverpool, the place they were heading for the day. They even shared photos of their favourite memories on their phones, and the more their laughter filled the carriage, the more I could feel myself smiling along with them. Somewhere between Sheffield and Stockport, I thought to myself, this train journey could have been very different for me if by chance I'd chosen somewhere else to sit. And I was grateful that they'd brought me some much needed joy that morning. The 50 minute journey flew by and suddenly it was time for me to leave. I really wanted to thank the two of them for making a difference to my day and for giving me hope in my work towards combating loneliness. I found a piece of paper in my bag that wasn't covered in yoghurt, <laughs> and I quickly scribbled some thoughts to give to them. As I got off the train, I handed the note to the man nearest the aisle and went on my way. I wasn't expecting to hear anything back from either of the men. So when I got to work on the following Monday to find an email with the subject title, Girl on the Train, I thought someone was trying to sell me the book. <laughs> in his reply, the man that I'd handed the note to days before said that 63 is the new 40 and that he'd loved talking with 80-year-old Morris on the train that day. Billy also said that he himself had experienced loneliness after the loss of his wife 
and he talked about his teenage children and how he volunteers to help cope with his grief. I was completely stunned and humbled. I replied to his email and then excitedly told all my friends, family and colleagues about the surprising response. Later that week, I shared the story on my Twitter account in the hope that it would bring a smile to even more people's faces. In the days that followed, the tweet was liked over 40,000 times and it caught the attention of national and international press. I was interviewed by many different journalists and the story was even translated into different languages. Three days after I'd sent the tweet, I found myself walking through the snow at 6am to speak on BBC Radio Sheffield and later that evening, BBC Five Live. People got in touch from India, Australia, America, to name just a few, all sharing their love for the letters, their own experiences of loneliness and their desire to go and do something different in their communities as a result of the story. In total, it's been estimated that over 31 million people on the train, not on the train, there weren't 31 million people on the train. <laughs> <laughs> over 31 million people have read about Bill and Morris on the train that morning. Amongst the media frenzy, Billy and I were reunited at a local friendship lunch in Sheffield. And a few weeks later, we even managed to track down Morris. When I spoke to him, he told me that he'd walked through Liverpool with Bill after the train journey, where they'd then shook hands and parted ways. Hearing that filled me with confidence that people do still look out for one another. And it reminded me that it's easier than we might think to do a small but remarkable thing for someone else. Even though it might not always feel like it, humans are wonderful. And if we harness the power in the small moments of connection, the potential is incredible. We need connections. From the moment we're born to the moment we die, so much of life is meant for sharing. And when we make that effort to connect, that non-judgmental, courageous and accepting effort we can never truly know just how far it will go. When we leave here today, lots of us will find ourselves getting swept back up into the fast-paced world that we live in. But before that happens, I would love it if you could remember one thing. To never underestimate the power and significance in making and nurturing connections with other people. Because that act, no matter how big or small, could be one of the most important things that you ever do. So, four words that help create a happier and healthier nation. When parents tell their struggling children, you can do it. And a few years and tears later, you go on to graduate with a first. When strangers in the street give you a hug and say, come to flute choir, and you find yourself with a brand new group of friends. When a remarkable doctor starts a campaign to ensure that all health professionals start their conversations with the words, hello, my name is, and people feel valued. And when a passenger on the train asks, traveling to Liverpool today, you might just go on to inspire people across the world to reach out to others that they've never met before. Like all of those people, together, we can carry Joe's legacy forward and we can help create a future where loneliness doesn't keep winning. The final four words I'd like to leave you with today are the words that can help take the sentiment of this talk so much further than this room. They are words that help me notice opportunities to connect with others. And they are words that remind me that every day is a new chance to start making a small ripple of change in the world. Four words that help create a happier and healthier nation. Hello, I see you. Thank you.